Uh, I think our guy is already here. Well, give a round of applause to Dave, our next speaker. Thanks, thanks for the applause. Uh, so, yeah, thanks, thanks for having me. And today, uh, I want to talk a little bit about a story of a project that I created during the confinement, uh, hard lockdown in Spain, uh, two or three years ago. Um, and, and yeah, the title of the talk is like, how to mimic a JavaScript feature in a strongly typed language, like OCaml, and over in CSS. So it mixes two of the, my favorite topics, which is like a strongly typed language and CSS, which they don't have nothing to do, but you would see today that they, they eventually do. So I'm David, I'm from Barcelona. I work remotely at Ahrefs. Uh, it's a SEO company that we provide a tool that um, mo most uh, SEO uh, marketing teams, uh, they, they pay us basically uh, to, to, to run the website, to, to understand the, the campaigns and to do all sorts of SEO things. Uh, before that, I work at Typeform and Dravid. So I have been uh, working for startups a long, long time um, and I create a few uh, open source project and I maintain them and today we're going to talk about style PPX. So back in the days uh, I used to work in, in Typhoon doing React. Uh, I was part of the, of the team that were doing the form so like all UI, uh, all like all the front-end logic was, was, was on our team and, and just to give a little bit of context um, that's where Facebook released React or like two years later and then like they start promoting um, some, some sort of like breaking the best, best practices. So one talk of Peter Hunt where tries to um, get rid of the, the monolithic approach of your HTML for, for the presentation, the CSS is for the styles and the JavaScript for the behavior. And the other talk that was very interesting as well was from Vijou, I think. Well, it's a French guy from, from React at that time that introduced CSS in JS. So, the first concept that um, stuck with me a lot was that at the beginning you were doing uh, all sorts of front-end stuff where you could um, render the HTML and add a little bit of CSS and a little bit of JavaScript and you would have your website. And the best practice at the time was you must have a file for each thing and you would never ever ever would put, like mix those, right? That was like a, a huge mistake uh, that like if you do a pull request with those changes, it would not get approved. Uh, but somehow uh, Facebook and, and the, the mental model for React, they challenged that. They said that every component should be like isolated and should contain the three of them. Um, they introduced GSX, so now the HTML is now as well like the component. They put the JavaScript inside and that was like the time for putting the CSS inside, right? So the kind of like the, the technology or pattern that was, it was called CSS in JS, right? Um, one of the problems when you do CSS at large scale, or, and even had that at Typeform, is that you'd have like a huge amount of CSS that nobody owns. Um, it would grow forever, and you would never ever feel safe to remove anything, because you wouldn't know if that change would affect all your application. And if you do the, those changes, it's going to be a nightmare to the back. So the, like, the good things about CSS in JS is that it um, allows to write actual CSS, so there's no layer between what you write and what's going to be in the browser. Um, it's all the global namespace, right? Um, in CSS, any class, any ID, uh, it's going to be global. So any, for instance, Chrome extension can override your CSS, for example. Um, or any, th any s small piece of HTML can uh, break your, your website. Um, the other good thing about that is that you could use JavaScript to enhance the, the limits of, of CSS. For example, you can style composition, you can abstract uh, some common logic, right? Um, the other thing is that you could share, of course, tokens and variables between the two languages. And it's very easy to pre predict when your CSS is, is coupled with your components. As soon as you remove a component, it's, you know, you know for sure that it's going to remove the, the CSS. So it's very predictable. Um, the other thing is that it's, it's very easy to rem the remove the styles because those are coupled together, right? Two of the uh, most famous back in the days uh, were style components in motion. Uh, they introduced the pattern of uh, the styled tag. So you would create <coughs> presentational components just by giving the CSS, right? You would see here that the CSS and your JavaScript lives on the same file, right? And, and you would create those components 
based on these, these tiny little uh, CSS definitions, right? Before getting into, like, just to give a lot of context, for someone who never saw JavaScript maybe or never have uh, experience with it, let's break down a little bit. So this, this syntax that I described here, it's called template literals, right? Template literals, in JavaScript you could have a string, which is a double quote normal string as most programming language, I guess. Um, and, and, and there's another syntax introduced like a few years ago uh, called template literals, which is uh, with these backticks, you can have interpolation uh, much cleaner than before, um, which allows some sort of like magic trick, I guess, uh, some sort of like syntactic, syntactic sugar, where you can um, call a function with a template literal, and those uh, strings interpolated are going to be like an array uh, in, in, your, in your function call, right? Um, how the CSS in JS underneath works, it's kind of like the whole magic of it is that every <coughs> component, uh, every component uh, at compile time, or depends on the library, but most of them are, are compile time, it would generate the, a hash for all your CSS, and at the, as soon as it renders, it's going to inject on the header um, the actual uh, declaration, and each element is going to be assigned to this class name. So you, you are sure that it's not going to have any collision with the rest of your style, and you could have as much components you want, and as soon as you re reuse some styles, are going to be added to a head, so you are fine. One of the things that I like the most about the, this approach is that when I give a design, or when I'm working with some designer or whatever, I like to think about those small components. So my head always maps perfectly what's on the screen, and what's on my code. So I rarely open the, the browser to see what's, what's inside, right? So like every piece gets mapped perfectly with the JSX, right? That's one of my favorite features. So yeah, that's a nice little animation. So one problem with JavaScript back in the days is that it's a loosely typed dynamic language. So we, we all kind of like, if, if you have experience with JavaScript, you, you already know what, what are all those problems about. I'm going to explain precisely what happens with CSS and JS problems. So the idea is that you would have uh, a link component and a primary prop, right? So you can pass the Boolean primary true or false, uh, but accept, of course, undefined, integer, or whatever. Um, what happens with this API is that you could easily assign this, this prop as a value on CSS, right? You can as well, like, call a function from that value, right? So you, you have a runtime on your CSS, that's fine. Um, but you can as well have a, a prop that changes a property of CSS. That's as well really valid, uh, but it can cause many, many problems. Um, it's very common in your application, if you keep doing that forever, um, you would end up like this, right? You're going to have like whatever property you're trying to define, but you define pixels, right? That, that's fine for the browser, because the browser is not going to uh, complain at you. It's not, it just, you're just not going to see that error. One of the good and bad things of the web is that the CSS, it's not, it's, it's not safe. Like, it's failure proof that, <laughs> that anything is not going to look as you expect, but no one, no one is going to tell you, right? So um, it's one of the most powerful things, I guess. But of course, if you're working in a company that you have like a, I don't know, hundreds of, of, of engineers working on it, this is going to be like a nightmare, right? Um, during that time, uh, I was, because of, the, of the, this React model, I got introduced into functional programming. So um, React pushed for immutability, push, push, push for pu poor functions, and I, and I was very intrigued with, with all the mathematical background that I, that I have, what's all this model about. So I, st I started playing with, with, with Elm, it, Elm is a, is, a, is a functional language, comes from Haskell, and, and it's beautiful, uh, and it's just for the browser. The other language that I got introduced to is Reason. Reason is the language that this, uh, this project I'm going to talk today is, is written about, um, but for, for the ones that, that, they, that you don't know, which is mainly common, uh, what's Reason, right? Uh, Reason is a functional, strongly typed programming language derived from OCaml. <laughs> okay, what's OCaml, right? Uh, so OCaml, it's a very old language, comes from the Lisp standard, F-sharp uh, languages. 
uh, of course, has all my favorite uh, features. So it's immutable, it's performant, because it meant to compete with uh, C or C Sharp or C++. Performance uh, is safe, uh, so it's strongly typed. Uh, it's practical in the sense of um, it encourages functional programming, but it's not as strict as Haskell. So you can get things dirty done uh, when you need to. And that's kind of like one of the good balances I see of the language. And as well, one of the key features is that uh, is inferred. So you don't need to uh, go to all the type definitions or go to all the functions or go to your model to, to type. The compiler is smart enough to guess which types are you using. And, and of course, are optional, so you can enforce the types, but most of the times you don't need to. So yeah, it's for the ones that you have experience with TypeScript, uh, TypeScript is like, I would say, half of the smart of the compiler of a camel, uh, where, where TypeScript sometimes infers properly, but uh, fails miserably most of the times, you would not have this experience with a camel. Another more things about the camel, just in case, uh, it's battle tested, so I think it's 20 years old. Um, and, and was thought, or at least it's very used in, in, in many fields to write a parser, a compiler, or formatter, anything that kind of like touches the, an AST, I think OCaml is the best language. Um, I think flow is written in, 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 in OCaml. Uh, the Rust started as, a, a, as, as an OCaml project, and Hack, I think it's in OCaml as well. So like most uh, compilers, or at least the people who come from uh, a CS background, uh, they're going to start with, with OCaml. Uh, has the decent tooling, uh, the compiler is fast and, and good messages, and, and it's a decent package manager. And one of the nice things about OCaml is its portability. You can compile to binary, interpret it, or to the web. So you can really distribute uh, OCaml everywhere. And you are in a good company, right? So like that's, those are the big companies that are present on the website that uh, we use uh, OCaml in production. And um, so go, let's go, going back to Reason, uh, was just a project f from Facebook as well, um, from the same creator as da Dan React. And the idea is that, okay, let's bring all the good compiler part of OCaml and to make it look like JavaScript so we can like, have all the, like, all the manpower of JavaScript that, that, that comes with it. One of the key things about, about it is that you can, you can target the browser. The browser. So, it was very easy to adopt. Uh, Reason, of course, comes with React built-in, so you don't need like a library, kind of like the compiler uh, understands uh, React. One thing, one disclaimer is that the Reason and Buckle script, like the compiler that goes to the browser, uh, was rebranding, I think, I think it was like August 220? Yeah, like last year, uh, they rebrand into, into Rescript, it, it doesn't really matter. Like I'm gonna talk uh, about Reason, OCaml, or Rescript interchangeably about, during this talk. Um, if you have doubts about it, it's fine. Like it, it was it, it was a mess. Now it should be gone. But of course, like I'm gonna mention Reason a lot, so I needed to this, to put a disclaimer. Um, so let's go back to my my journey. Uh, so I was very interested in the CSS in JS kind of like pattern or way of of working but I wanted to discover that in Reason. So I already left my previous company. I joined Draftbit at the time, and they were using Reason in production. So I was like, how can we use CSS in JS? Is CSS in Reason? Did I, did I invent the, the term? Well, it uh, was a little bit silly, but um, turns out that many people, when I look at it, many, many people were, were, were asking that. So there's, there's definitely an interest. And I thought, okay, see, if there's so many people interested and the community is very bright and smart, why nobody like, kind of like started this? So I thought, okay, maybe should I? I don't know. And then the solution that came up very early are bindings to the CSS, which, which means you'd write um, all the spec of CSS, or at least try to all the common properties from CSS, you would turn them into functions, uh, all, all units, so pixels, rems, uh, percentages, everything is going to be a function, and all values should be, ba all CSS values should be reason values. So you would write with uh, some sort of DSL that it feels like CSS, but of course um, it's not, right? So 
you, you can have like all the good things about like auto-completion, uh, you could have error messages, it's gonna be type safe, but again, you would need to learn this DSL, and if you are handling that to a designer, they're not gonna understand at all. Uh, and one of the things that you would lose is the JSX that I mentioned before, like here, I cannot see clearly what's what, right? Like I don't know, like that's very hard to parse mentally uh, compared to the previous version, right? Uh, here are, of course, like some of the good things, but the bad things, the worst cons that I found, uh, it's that there has no integrations with the app tools. So I cannot go to, the, to Chrome, play around with CSS, go back to my browser and keep looping. I need to translate it to in this pseudo language. That's the most annoying part. And of course, you don't have like the copilot, right? You don't have like integrations that get out of the way. So you are not using the platform, you're just using your own invented language. Um, and I really wanted to write CSS. I, I've been, I think, doing web for 10 years and I'm very used to all the patterns, all the tricks, uh, and, and I just wanted to, to use CSS. Uh, but one of the biggest problems with Reason is that the template leader, the, the feature that I explained before in JavaScript, uh, doesn't exist. So I was like, okay, there, there, there must be a way. Like, there, it's not possible that it cannot, be, it cannot be done, right? It's just language, right? And then adding the, um, adding most of the, uh, reading most of the blog posts that I have read from Camel, I read something which is PPX, right? It's a preprocessor extension, and I'm gonna explain a little bit what it is. Uh, and I think, right, yeah, it's the, it's a solution that a compiler gives to extend the syntax, right? Uh, the, the, the people who work in the compiler, they don't, they don't care about your problem about syntax, so they, they, they provide this way to extend the compiler. Um, it's very useful for support your DSL, like this example. DSL is like domain-specific language, it's like whatever language that you want to, to write. Uh, it's well, like very useful to generate boilerplate, so you can add these PPXs to, to, to generate like encoding, decoding, transformations, debugging, logging, all of this. Uh, is well like very useful to perf performance. Sometimes you can add uh, the, this, an, another PPX that does tile optimization. You can uh, recursive early, and you can do like all sorts of like good problems uh, to solve from, from w what you couldn't do with code, you could do it at compile time, right? Per I'm gonna explain per uh, what preprocessing means in a second. And yeah, the last one is that you can add metadata to, to your code, right? Uh, at the end of the day, you feel like the writing of a PX is kind of like a magic. It's like half of things you don't understand because you are really, really getting deep onto the compiler and, and, and you have no clue how, how the AST of, of, of a camel works, right? So the general idea, just to get you into, 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 the, into the concept, um, the, the compiler gets your source code as, as plain text and transform it into, into parse tree. Parse tree is, is the same structure as Dave show, showed before, which is like a tree of all your nodes as code, and, and, and they are connected. Um, and then it sends it to all the PPX that you're using, the PPX get these AST, do some sort of transformation, and keeps going with the compilation, right? At this point, uh, you, are, you are, like in your PPX, what you get is AST, which doesn't contain any types, right? After the compilation uh, step, you have these types. So you are, you are working almost with text, right? The general idea is that PPX is a function that gets AST, needs to generate valid AST, right? Um, it's very important that you generate proper AST because if you have a, not a syntactic error, it's impossible to get a syntactic error, but if you do something that lexic, lexical semantic or lexical meaning is broken, uh, you wouldn't know, right? And, and, it, and those issues are very hard to debug. You can think of, of, of them about like some macro systems. So I think the most common one, maybe if you're from front end, is bubble macros. Um, but yeah, that's kind of like what, what we have in Ocamo, right? Uh, another, like a few examples. These are like the, one, the top is, is made up, but the bottom is, is GraphQL. So same example, you want, you want to embed your GraphQL queries inside uh, your, your reason files, of course, OCaml doesn't support GraphQL natively, so we have 
uh, some, some person uh, implement a GraphQL BPX so you can support uh, GraphQL. Right, so once all of these came out and I understood all the concepts, I thought, okay, we have a syntax. Like, I think, I think the idea can work, right? So it, that's very similar with the, with the JavaScript syntax. Uh, it's just like a module, uh, the first style PPX co component, that's, that's, that's a component in React, and this, this element is a deep, and this has a style. That's kind of like very easy to translate, right? When this happened, I started go coding madly. Uh, that was during the, the lockdown in Spain that took, I don't know, 60 days? 60 days, maybe, like around two, three months. So I was like coding all nights around this. Uh, so the, the first idea was, okay, that's the steps that they need to do. So I need to get this CSS, parse it and, and transform it into, AS, into an AST. And then I need to transform this CSS into the bindings that, that I referred before, and then generate all the, the boilerplate. How more or less this works is like I get the CSS, and then I write my own parser, because in Ogamal there was like not a very new CSS parser at the time. There were like a few old ones that support uh, CSS2. I needed, of course, like the CSS3 or the latest version. So I use Menir. Menir is a, a LR parser uh, generator, which means that if you, if you give your formal verification of your, of your language, it's going to generate a, a parser for you. Um, and it's one of the most advanced parser generators that um, exist, basically, right? So if the formal grammar is something like that, which I don't, I, that this is not really like something that you would understand this. This is the formal verification of, of a part of, of a camel. But the idea is that there's some, some, some sort of notation that generates a parser for you, right? So I needed to write my, my, own, uh, my own parser, basically, right? Um, creating a parser, it's, it's something that I have not thought before, before starting th this project. And while I was discovering all these libraries, all these methods, um, I, I stopped for, for a minute and I created like some more like toys and then like these little concepts, what LR means, what context-free grammar means, and, and all these like uh, things that I, I heard them in, 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 the, in my career, but pff, I never took, took, took attention to them. So that was like the time to, to, to invest in learning. Um, the, the only idea that needs to, needs to matter today is that you can have like all your CSS definitions are based on declarations. Uh, these declarations have property and value, right? And this, of course, needs to be translated to AST. Uh, this is the, like the happy path, like three port properties or a list of properties is, is the easy path, but the, we can work with we can work with the stuff on, on, on your right, and we cannot work with stuff on the left. On the right, we can understand what's, what are those declarations, and after that, we, we can turn this AST into the bindings, right? So I can translate easily properties uh, and add compile time, right? Uh, the last step is like, given these styles, I need to generate like all the boilerplate for, for, uh, for a React component, right? Um, sorry. Yeah, so I got, I got my project. Uh, I was super happy. You would write CSS. You would have type safe. It, 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 it was like I was on top of the wall. So I went to Twitter. I tweeted out. I was super happy. Got a lot of traction, a lot of feedback. Uh, but there were a few problems, of course. Problem number one is that interpolation was not, word, was not implemented, which means like the interpolation that you could have in JavaScript uh, means that you could uh, pass props to the component and these, these props can go to, to the values, right? That was like, okay, that's something that we need to figure out. There was another problem that people came up to my repo say, oh, this property doesn't, it's not supported. And I was like, okay, I need to create a, a pull request to another repo, update my repo, publish a new version, just for one little vari variable. That was very annoying. So uh, in order to solve this problem, uh, it was just like, just add type safety to, to the CSS parser. That's, that's, that's easier, right? Uh, no, that's not that easy. So the, the question was like, how, how can we do that in, in a, is that even possible? Like, can, can we know which properties goes with which values? Can we, 
where, where this information comes from, where does it live, right? Like properties, I think there are like 200 properties and these 200 properties can have any sort of combination, almost. Okay, now, there is some data around the internet and the end, like the Mozilla documentation, uh, they do have this data. So it was just a matter to grab this data and do something with it, right? Uh, so what we did is we grabbed this data and wrote, we wrote another parser for their specific language. I'm gonna explain exactly what it is now. And then I just need to generate a parser combinator, right? What Eduardo would say, super easy, that's a one weekend. Uh, so one of, the, one of the problems is that of course, uh, this, this data is huge, right? And it uses a, a notation or a syntax called Bacchus Naus form, I guess. And, 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 and it looks trivial to understand for the humans, uh, but at, at the first grabs, you have no clue where it is. It's very similar to the grammar, uh, that formal grammar that I explained before. So one of, like, a, 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 check, a, a cheat sheet of how it looks like is that there's these small operators so the, the grammar is this one, right? I cannot even see it, but the, the idea is that you could write with the spaces, means something, the, the, the pipe means, means one another, another, the double pipe means doesn't mark the order, etc. right? So when I just saw this, or that was half implemented be, between me and, and Eduardo, but when we saw this, it was like, that's perfect for a parser combinator because we just need to, to implement these combinators, and then we can support the entire CSS, right? Okay, uh, like the concept again, super, super easy in my head, very hard to implement, but the idea is that, for example, a property like, like border, and you can have none, that's a, that's a revalue, you can have just the line width, that's border one pixel, you can have the, the line width and the line style, and you have the line width, the line style, and the color, right? That's the definition of, of border, or at least it'd be the changed, but that's kind of like the definition. As well, you would have all the references. So line width is not a primitive in CSS. Uh, line width can be a length, which is a primitive, and then a few other variants, right? So that's kind of like the mental model that you can think of a parser combinator. Uh, and the idea is that you would, you would need to have a function that for any input, you would need to parse all the, all the variants that you have in the definition, right? I think my words didn't make any sense, but I think the code it, did that, right? Uh, so that's the code, but the, the idea is that you would have a function that given an input, it would say, okay, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine, or oh, this one is really not fine, and it would give you some sort of a good error message. Um, one of the... Uh, I don't know. So one of the error messages that you can get is that, okay, display blocky doesn't, doesn't exist. Uh, one of the few options are all of these, right? Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's the errors that we have now, uh, but, but yeah, it, it was possible because we knew all the definitions that we got. Right. Uh, seems that I cannot pass. Okay, so at that time, once we implement all of this, I was, I was truly happy because you can have type check CSS, which I'm not, I was like, I, I still, I'm not aware of anyone who, who, who did that or wanted that. Uh, so, so we, we fr from the first day until that, that moment, it was like, okay, we did something that was for, for like, maybe nobody cares, but for me it was, was really impressive. Um, but we still have like the prom, prom, problem number one, right? Like, there was like no interpolation. So following more or less the same syntax, we thought, okay, let's try to get the same concept as interpolation, but limit it a little bit more to, hunt, like, to be very friendly for our parser. The idea is that those values cannot be um, interpolated anywhere. They must go into values, right? So you can only pass the color, and this color needs to be the color. You cannot put it as a property, okay? The idea is that you can, you can have the syntax and like the PPX or the compiler needs to transform it into this one, right? As you see here, size and color are variables that are, are in scope and, and, and they come from, from the function, right? 
these two variables at this moment before the compilation, they don't have any type and that would be unsafe. But once you run the compiler, OCaml is going to say, okay, because font size expects a CSS length, size needs to be length. So by type inference, uh, we have an API that turns to be type safe, right? So the color that you need to pass to heading, it needs to be a CSS color. If you pass anything else, you'd have a, a perfectly nice uh, compiler error. That's gonna say, I expect a color, you give me something else. Fix, fix it, I don't wanna run. Uh, at this time, an another celebration, that was like a moment where, where, where this, this was like a, a proud moment I have, where I got like these type holes, so variables that you have at runtime to be type safe. It was a, one of the first problems that I suffer, I don't know, like two years before. So that was, that was kind of like a, a big moment for me. Uh, the kind of like wrapping up the whole, the whole project and the whole presentation, one of the first, first conclusions I learned that I go is that go with a mission approach. Uh, when, when I started, I wanted to go very minimal to not, not, like, not make any, anyone like uh, rewrite their thing or was, was scared to, to break up uh, with, with, the, with the community or whatever fear they got. Uh, and once I said, that's, that's just bullshit, uh, I should go with ambitious and, and try to port the same ideas to, to another language and, and go deeper as I can until, until kind of solve it. That worked for me but I can, I can recommend for, for, for anything else. The other one is that your open source project can become your job. At some point during this journey, uh, Ahrefs contacted me after the Twitter thread and all of this, and, and they offered me a job to work full time on this. So I know that can become is a little bit to, to your pet project and your fun project, but at the end of the day, if you keep pushing, you keep pushing, and there's real value, uh, there's gonna be a company that's gonna pay your time. So for me, that, that was really great. And, and I hope that if you have like, the energy and the time, it works for you as well. The other one learning is that writing a PPX is a great path to write a compiler. Writing a compiler has like, all these, these uh, massive uh, respects or a lot of like, fear because it sounds super complex. Um, I, can, I can say confidently that three, four years ago, it felt the same for me, but now I'm overconfident. <laughs> on writing a compiler because I have been like, doing it for, I don't know, two or three years, and, and the concepts are the same as you are doing in your day-to-day -day job, it's just the mental models are different. And of course, like, a lot of people have put a lot of thought into it, but it's just a matter to translate this knowledge into your own knowledge. And once you understand what a compiler is, you can talk with same concepts as people who wrote the language uh, they, they speak, which I think, is kind of like the next level when you're working or you are very interested in programming languages. So that's a path that I would do again. And the kind of like the last one is that OCaml and Reason are fantastic. Uh, I wouldn't be here or I wouldn't be in, in my job if I, it, it wasn't for, for these two languages. So yeah, if you have time this weekend or next week, you can try, try them out, uh, they are fun. And that's kind of like my last slide. Uh, thanks for listening to me. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer any. <laughs>